everyone. Welcome to Container Office Hours. In this session, we're going to talk about uh, how to get started, how to contain your first application, and what to uh, you know what to do with it once you have it built. Uh, I think it's probably a good thing to um, to first talk about you know what do containers even do for us? Why are they so useful? Why is everyone talking about containers these days? I have Nathan Peck with me. Hello. I'm Brent Langston. We're both on the container services team. Uh, we're senior developer advocates. And, you know, this is what we do. We, we talk about containers like all day, every day. Uh, so, prior, prior to joining uh, AWS, I actually worked at a couple of different startups using containers. Yeah. Uh, so I've run containers in production and now happy to help other people get success at running their containers in production. What problem or problems... Uh, are solved by running containers? Uh, so I would say one of the first problems that I initially identified that I need these containers to solve was just packaging up all the dependencies for an application. Um, because there were a couple times uh, prior to using containers where our production service went down because a developer was coding locally with one version of Node.js, but then the servers had a different version of Node.js installed on them. And so after the, like, Second time that happened, I said, this is a problem we got to solve. We got to figure out a, a way to get a consistent uh, version of the runtime locally as well as in the cloud. And so started doing some research on that. Docker containers popped up. This was, this must have been like pretty early on um, after Docker containers started to become um, popular. They were, they were just starting up on the, right. on the upswing. And I said, this sounds, this sounds like a great way to package up. Uh, the runtime as well as the dependencies as well as the code and make sure it's consistent on the on the laptop as well as on the server. Totally. The other, you know, in addition to that, I ran into uh, similar problems when I first discovered containers. Uh, kind of the same thing, but it was with Ruby. Mm -hmm. And we had like two pieces of code that we needed to run on the same host, but they each needed different versions of Ruby. And, you know, like figuring out yeah, there were ways to do that, but you know, we were going to run into the same problem with Python. We were going to run into the same problem potentially with Node. So you know, like let's solve the problem once and one way consistently, rather than trying to figure out like how do we use RVM for Ruby and how do we have multiple versions of Node and how do we do it for Python? Like all of those unique ways. So you know, Docker and containers. Uh, really got that right. They really focused on, you know, like solving the problem for developers and getting code to be easily packaged and then easily shipped and easily distributed. And uh, you're able to do it basically no matter the language. So we're going to take a look today at, you know, we're just going to take an app. We're going to Dockerize it. We're going to push it to the artifact store, uh, also called the Docker registry. We're going to use ECR for that. And then we're going to uh, connect up, I'm going to, we're going to start up a server and pull it and run it. And you'll see that, you know, even though that server doesn't have Node installed on it, uh, it's it's going to be able to run our application. So I think, you know, it's going to hopefully open, open some eyes to how simple uh, this can actually be. And uh, feel free to, to uh, ask questions in the chat anytime. Uh, if something doesn't make any sense, you have a, have another question about Docker, um, feel free to comment in the chat. We're watching the chat and uh, there to answer your questions. Yeah, and actually, I want to throw out a question to the to the uh, stream already. Just how many of you guys out there are already using Docker, or you work at a place where you're using Docker and you need to get more, you know, up to speed with it? Uh, sound off in the chat. Let us know. You know, let us know what's going on. All right, cool. So. We don't need to focus a whole bunch on the application to, to sort of show you the ins and outs of, of Dockerizing. So uh, we're going to use a really simple Hello World application. Uh, so let's go to the code, uh, go to our screens, and let's just take a look at, you know, what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to, I have all of this in a repo right now. I'm going to be uh, unlocking this and, and opening it by the end of the show, so uh, you'll have access to all this stuff too. But I wanted to start with nothing. So there is literally nothing in this, re in this directory right now, and we're just going to build this up 
you know, from, from scratch. So we're going to start with a Node.js Hello World app. And I, I copied this from uh, the internet. So, like, yeah. you know. It, Pretty standard Hello World, just a basic express server. <laughs> exactly, right? So I should now have an app.js that uh, calls uh, express and then, you know, outputs Hello World. So if I try to run this application, uh, node app.js, I get an error. So what's this? I mean, already I've screwed something up. What's wrong? <laughs> so clearly what's going on here is you didn't install the dependencies for this application. It, it, it is depending on the express web server that it uses to actually start listening on that port. And then it hooks up that handler uh, to any response that, that comes in. So we got to install that express uh, module. Totally right. So uh, as I would expect. Um, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, we want an example to show you, you know, dependency management and dependency portability. Yeah. Uh, we, we need an example that has a dependency. So uh, our dependency is, is on the express module. All right. So let's install express. So we'll, I'm going to use NPM for that. Uh, I'm going to create a skeleton package.json, and then I'm just going to npm install express. And we'll take a look at package.json now. And let's just see that, what? Wait, did I do that wrong? No, it's in there. Uh, under dependencies, I see that add express. There it is. Uh, version 4.16.4. Exactly. So I have express installed. It's uh, now uh, available so that when I run node app.js, mm -hmm. boom. Yep, it's working. All right, let's test it. I love testing. Uh, let's blow this up so you can see it. Yeah. Simple, simple test, just curl localhost port 3000. Yep, there's our hello world. Man, I am an app developer now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, one thing I, uh, I want to point out is I like to start out with this type of like super simple skeleton app uh, when I'm first investigating new technology because it can be hard if you bring in your full um, production app that has all sorts of dependencies, all sorts of different pieces of code, and you try to take that as your first Docker container, you're probably going to run into issues. But I find it's easier to start out with like a simple skeleton app that's only a few lines long. All it has is a simple web server. And then once you get that deployed in there, you already know that your whole um, build and deploy process is, is working properly. Now you can go in there and start adding the complexity to yeah. your full app. That's right. It's the baggage. You yeah. start without it. Then you, you build out the, the pipeline, the workflow, whatever you want to think of, build out the logic, and then uh, you know bring in the baggage after mm -hmm. that, and you'll be pre better prepared for it. All right. So we have a working application, but of course it's not portable. You yeah. know, if I were to just copy app.js to uh, one of my servers, um, you know, there'd be a lot more that I would need to do to the server. I'd have to have Node installed, I'd have to have Express installed. Uh, well, that's it. But still, <laughs> you know, that's stuff, right? And I don't want to have to worry about all that. So um, what we're going to do next is let's actually Dockerize it. Okay, so let's talk for a second about what Docker and what uh, containers actually are. Are they are they VMs? Uh, no. So it has some of the characteristics of a VM, but it's much more lightweight. Um, the difference being that uh, a container is really just a wrapper of permissions around a process that's limiting it. So with a VM, your process is running inside uh, its own virtual machine on the same host, but all of the processes that are in different Docker containers, maybe on the same host, you'll see all of them if you go and do like a PS aux totally. on, your, on your host. But yeah. they each have like a security sandbox around them and a namespace that limits, so that way they can't see each other. Yeah. From their perspective, it's like they have their own fresh host uh, yeah. and their own file system and their own limited set of permissions, but on the host, you can look down, you can see all of them. Yeah, so like if you think about it from the other direction completely, mm -hmm. if I had a, if I just wanted to run a process, but I want that process to be uh, a little bit confined, you mm -hmm. know, a little bit like isolated, 
uh, and but otherwise, you know, still just run on my on my instance in my operating system. Then I I have there are tools that can help me do that. There are C groups, there are namespaces, uh, there's all kinds of stuff built into the operating system to help me do that. But setting all that stuff up is complicated, right? And there's a lot that you can do and a lot that you can mess up. Uh, Docker came along and they're just like, you know, let's automate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's make it simple to, uh, to the developer. And in fact, what we'll do is we'll store the automation right alongside the code. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way, you know, when the developer is ready to ship their code, uh, you know, the description of how it needs to be built and everything is just right there with it. And it can be built in a consistent way and it can be run in a consistent way uh, on basically any host. So that's what, that's what Docker is about. That's what containers are about. So I figured, um, you know, this uh, Hello World application should be really simple. Now, if I'm thinking, again, kind of from the standpoint of like coming from, uh, you know, setting up VMs, setting up instances and stuff like that, then the first decision that you make is kind of like, what's your starting point, right? Yeah. Um, so I am, you know, kind of a, I'm, there are two camps in the Linux world. There's like the Debian dpackage camp, and then there's the RPM apt or RPM yum camp. I'm an RPM yum kind of guy, so uh, I say the, from... The best tool to use is the one you're familiar with. <laughs> that's so. right, exactly. So I say from CentOS, that's, that's going to be my starting point. So let's create a Docker file. And, you know, like, we're just going to start out with... Can you, can you zoom in a little bit? Zoom in. Is that better? From CentOS. So, like, this is going to be my starting point. It's going to be really, really simple. And that's that's just my Docker file. I haven't done anything with the application yet, but let's just build this and let's see what happens. Yeah, sure. Uh, Docker build dot. So, dot is current working directory. So, basically, what we're saying is uh, look inside this directory and build whatever you find inside the file named Docker file with a capital D. All right, so... We, we got one question that popped up in the chat. Could we stress test this containerized app? Maybe create a small cluster behind load balancer and stress test again. Um, yeah, we have to build it first. So once we've got it built and we can run it, then maybe we can experiment with running an A-B test against it. Um, I think uh, actually launching the whole cluster and load balancer is a little bit outside the scope of what we're trying to do today. Yeah. Um, but we could maybe run a B testing us locally on the, on your laptop. <laughs> I think I could probably, yeah. well, so I think what we could do is potentially like, you know, point to another video where oh, yeah, we've yeah. done some, uh, auto scaling, uh, you know, because the, the direct response to stress testing is scaling, right? So, yeah. uh, one of the great things about Docker, about containers is, uh, you can run as many of them as you want to run. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you... You know, if you have like a, a Ruby application and it can only handle a thousand ops per second, then you might need to run, you know, a hundred of them. But if you have a Node.js application and it can run, you know, it can handle 10,000 ops per second, maybe you only need to have 10 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, none of that matters if you set up auto scaling. So, I mean, there's still like, you know, some, some of it matters, cost and capacity and yeah. that sort of thing. But if you have auto scaling set up, basically all of that can take care of itself. Um, so I think, you know, at the end of this, we'll post a link to a video where uh, one of us is talking about yeah. auto scaling and, and hopefully that can help answer that question. Sure. And then if that, you know, if we want to, we can look at maybe having another, uh, office hours. Where yeah, we're that's a great uh, suggestion for a future uh, episode of this uh, event. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's going to be, uh, more advanced than this session though. Yeah. All right. So we have our container built. Let's, you know, let's poke around, look at things, Docker images, before we get much further, I'm going to clear my cache. You got a lot of cache. images on that machine. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you know what? I'm going to clear my cache right now. Uh, Docker system prune. Uh, I think it's dash A or something. Yep. Dash A yep. for, for well, all. all. But I like to think everything. <clears throat> a means everything. Not really. A means all. So we're going to clear off everything from this laptop. 
and then we're going to build it again. And then we can see the image and uh, what, you know, kind of what it looks like. Amazing. Wow. 2.8 gigs. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I do a lot with containers. Um, Docker build. So, oh, good, good thing. This time, if you remember last time, nothing downloaded. This time, something downloaded because I had the image cached. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at how Docker uh, does caching, and we're going to start to use that to our advantage here in a minute. But so what you got now is a basic image that is based off of CentOS. Exactly. Yeah. So I didn't build it. Uh, CentOS actually built it. This is their official image. And by the way, you can you can know that because it came from library slash CentOS. I didn't have to say library. I didn't have to ask for it. But because I didn't ask for anything else, I got the official library uh, CentOS. And notice... It's 202 megs, so I haven't put my application on there yet, mm -hmm. uh, and I already I'm at 202 megs. Um, I'm fine with that right now because we're getting started, but this is going to become a theme. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna focus on that. How uh, to get, how to get that that size down? Exactly. Eventually. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So here's another thing. Um, I did Docker build. I did from CentOS, and look, I got tag latest. Um, what what's a tag? Uh, so just like a uh, a GitHub repo, it has different branches, and maybe you have like a your master branch, which is the current state of the code. You also maybe have a feature branch, um, a repository which is storing Docker images has different tags, and you can think about the tags kind of like branches. Um, you push to a tag, and so a lot of the of the registries will have the latest tag, which is just whatever the latest version of CentOS is. But then they'll also have a tag, which is for CentOS version X, Y, Z, exactly. um, or maybe like an experimental like beta tag. And so I, I generally prefer not to use the latest tag for anything, especially not in production. I want to limit it to a specific tag that I want to start from. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So tagging is, in fact, I love your comparison to Git because Git also has tags. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the tags in both Git and in uh, Docker imaging, they're not immutable. So you, you can move them around. And so as, as uh, the CentOS people push new versions of this image, they move that latest tag to whatever the newest version that they just pushed is. So anytime you ask for latest, uh, you're going to get, you know, whatever is most recently tagged as latest, not what was latest, you know, months ago. There's well, a, a question in the chat. Somebody's asking, is there anything special with Docker desktop versus a Linux production environment? I don't, well, yes, sort of. <laughs> um, I, Docker desktop I, I would includes say the, Kubernetes. I'd say the answer is yes and no. <laughs> yeah, like the engine, so the, the Linux server, you know, edition is sort of broken up into individual components and you can install, uh, you know, just certain components or you can install, well, no, you can choose to install many of the components. Uh, desktop gives you like a whole bunch of components all at once and it includes Kubernetes for that matter. So mm -hmm. like if you need... Uh, an orchestrator to orchestrate a whole bunch of Docker containers. Uh, you can, you know, start to experiment with Kubernetes on your desktop, and then, you know, build out your workflow, and then push it to, uh, you know, a server or set of servers that, you know, might launch your container containers out onto a fleet of servers. And uh, I would say both of us are also developing on uh, Mac machines, and so the way that Docker works is a little bit different in Mac. But the way that uh, the, the reason why I say no, there's no difference is that any commands I would run here locally on my, on my laptop, they're going to be the same as the commands I would run on a Linux machine. And any images that I build on my Mac machine are also going to be compatible and run perfectly on a Linux production machine. So, yes, there are some differences in how Docker desktop works relative to the Docker that gets installed on the server. But functionally, how I use it, it's going to be the exact same, the exact same experience. Exactly. So these components, Docker Engine, you can only you can install only Docker Engine on a server if you want. Uh, Docker Compose, you would add that to your server if you want that. 
Uh, with Docker Desktop, you just get all of it all, all together. So uh, that's the difference. Also, on Mac specifically, um, Docker is actually running, uh, the engine is actually running inside a Linux VM running mm -hmm. on your Mac. So uh, they've done a really good job of integrating that so that you don't see it and you don't have to really uh, think about it in those terms. But, um, but yeah, the, you know, when we're running our, our code uh, on Mac, it's actually going to be running inside a Linux VM on the Mac. So when we take that and we uh, put it out to a Linux you know, server and EC2, uh, it's still going to be on Linux. Yep. Cool. All right. So tags, like you said, you don't really like to use latest because latest isn't super specific. It's, it's whatever, you know, latest might be today. And, you know, a few months from now, if you try to do this whole process again, latest might be different. And because of that, you know, the behavior might ch have changed. So it's good to be specific. Uh, when you're pulling from upstream from remote repositories. So there's a, a related question in the chat. How often are Docker Hub images updated? And I would say it, it just depends. Like that one, you could see it was created two months ago. Exactly. But some of the more popular ones, they update them every every few days. Yeah. So if we look at, um, in fact, I have the link for, uh, let's see, the CentOS uh Docker Hub, if we just go and we look at the tags, uh, so, you know, pick your favorite, go to Docker Hub and look at the tags, and you'll see that, you know, like, it's been six days since they've updated anything, uh, but if you look at, you know, kind of the regularity the, of which they update stuff, wow, okay. Well, they so, absolutely, they have an automated build process that rebuilds totally. everything. It looks like, but yeah, some of those are two years Six old. Days to <laughs> two years. All right, so maybe this isn't the best way to judge how they how often they build things, because um, I know they've done builds between you know two years and six days. Oh, or, yeah. you know between that time. But but generally speaking, like they do update these images fairly often, so I do like to have an automated rebuild process periodically. Yeah, just to rebuild from the image to make sure that I have the latest version with ideally very few, if any, vulnerabilities. Exactly. So, but then, you know, grabbing whatever the version number is and pinning, pinning that inside your Docker file is uh, really, really handy. Mm -hmm. So the way you do it is image name colon tag name. Mm -hmm. uh, and the tag format that CentOS uses looks a little bit like this. So what I'm saying here is this is the latest version of seven that they have available. Uh, so I'm going to start building using that version. And that way, you know, two, three, four months down the road, if I need to come back and ch make a change and build again, um, I can consider updating the tag, but at least it'll be me knowingly doing it and then checking to see that everything works. Whereas if I just use latest, then basically it will get done for me and I won't, I won't know to check, you know, to see that everything works. All right, so Docker build. Now I'm downloading uh, 7.6.18.10, and otherwise it's going to be, you know, basically the same process as before. Now there's another thing I'm going to point out here that we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit, but notice we're sending build context to Docker Daemon, and it's 1.9 megabytes. What that mean? What does that mean? It means that we're, uh, we're taking the contents of that folder and we're making it available because we said Docker build in dot the current working directory. We're saying grab everything in this current working directory and make it available for Docker to use in that build. Exactly. So we're gonna we're gonna make use of that here uh, right now. Okay. So we have our image. It's just our starting point. We haven't done anything with our application. Think about what would you have to do uh, with your application. So you need to copy it. So Let's do that. Oops. The, the way I usually think about it is like, if I was SSH'd into a box, yep. um, what commands would I need to run to make that instance uh, capable of running my application? Yeah, totally. And in fact, you can, you know, here's a hint for uh, Docker file. Uh, the first word in, you know, every line of the Docker file is a Docker uh, Docker file command, right? It's, it's, so, it's basically a verb, one of the verbs exactly. that tells uh, 
uh, Docker itself what to do when it's building that image. Yeah, so the first thing I would need to do is copy my application into the image, and then the next thing I would need to do is what I did on the command line when I tested it, I did, uh, I ran uh, node app.js. Now let's build that. Yep, we got a we got an error. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So uh, what went wrong? Why you know? Well, okay. So first of all, there's no actual Node uh, JS in that in that uh, in that container. So just like you know, if I was trying to launch my Node JS application on an EC2 instance and I just copied SCP'd my code to the server and then tried to run it, it wouldn't run unless I also installed Node. So we got to add Node to the CentOS. Even though there's Node outside on my host laptop that I'm using for developing, um, the container is an isolated environment. So inside the container, there is actually no Node.js. It's just a pure, plain, uh, blank CentOS environment. Even though I have Node outside on my developer uh, environment. So I have to actually install Node itself inside the container before I can use it. Yeah. I also messed that up. The verb is... Oh, yeah. Command. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... You're yeah. totally right. I wasn't going to call you out on that. But. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> luckily, I've done this once already. Uh, okay, so we're going to run the installer that is going to install Node.js 10. Uh, and then all that does is it sets it up so that we can use yum uh, to then install the packages themselves. So we'll yum install Node.js. So again, just like what we would do if we were doing this on a CentOS VM. Mm -hmm. And you can see the output, like if we were SSH'd in, uh, there's our yum output. Done. Yep, we've got node installed now. Cool. All right, so it looks like we have a successful build. Should we try it? Yeah, go for it. All right, so uh, Docker run. Oh, you're looking at my history. <laughs> Docker. We'll teach you well, well, first, yeah, let's do Docker images. Okay, so wait, that doesn't look helpful. What what's going on here? Uh, you didn't uh, you didn't put a, a name tag on the image when you created it. Yeah, so I can I can still use it like this. Yeah, but man, it's annoying. Um, so yeah, I, I, I you I know don't like to have to rely on a created date. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's nothing here that really like helps me understand that this is the image that I need to run. Uh, Except that I see that, it, you know, I just built it 18 seconds ago. Also, by the way, while we're looking at it, look at the size. Mm -hmm. You know, we went from 203 megs to 377 megs. We did stuff inside the container. We installed Node and all that good stuff. Looks like Node is about 170 <laughs> megabytes. In size. I mean, <laughs> good stuff, good things. You know? <laughs> all right. So what we want to do, though, is we want to build this image so that uh, so that it, you know, has a human-friendly uh, mm -hmm. way to, to talk to it or to, to call it. So um, docker build dash T for tag. Mm -hmm. And let's call this uh, docker hello world. And this time I am going to use latest because mm -hmm. since I'm developing the, the workflow itself, um, I'm okay with using latest. Later, I might change that to be something that's like specific to my git commit hash or, or something like that. Um, so docker hello world latest dot. Again, build the current working directory. Whoa, that was fast. Yeah, and the reason why it's so fast is because it had already done that work in a previous, uh, previous command. So you see a lot of lines in there that says like using cache, using cache, using cache. Yeah. It already done those steps, so it doesn't have to redo them again. Exactly. So this, from a developer perspective, uh, is huge because, you know, if you're a developer and you're, you're having to sit there waiting on your code to build every time, you know, you make a, an edit, uh, you don't want to have to start from zero. You want, you know, everything that has been done to just be used, reused. So Docker caches all these layers that they build, these step one, two, three, four, five, these are all layers that uh, are being built into our image. And as long as nothing on the Docker line has changed, or as long as nothing in a file that we're copying in has changed, uh, then it's just gonna reuse that layer as cache. As soon as, by the way, 
uh, we change something, uh, you know, in a layer, every layer after that in, gets their cache invalidated. Mm -hmm. So, like, we'll, we'll cache as much as we can until we can't, and then nothing after that is cached anymore. And there's we'll, a, we're going to There's talk a question for, is there an equivalent for apt update that needs to be run often? Is that something you shouldn't need to run if you're using the correct base image? Um, Good question. Yeah. This is something that I see. Uh, I see it on Reddit a lot. You know, like how do you update images and how do you uh, patch them and stuff like that. Um, there's two two approaches. One is uh, use the latest image you can. You know, after you validated that it works and all that stuff. And then in addition to that, uh, consider doing some kind of yum update inside of it. Here's the trade-off. This is, this is a style decision uh, that you'll make for you. But the trade-off is if I start with a base image and a tag, I can reproduce that a year from now, right? As long as that image is still out on Docker Hub, uh, I can copy, you know, I can start there, copy my same code into it, and I'll get the exact same artifact out of it every single time. As soon as I introduce something that's sort of variable, like a yum update, uh, into the into that workflow. Well, you know, today I'll get one result. Tomorrow or a year from now, I'll get a different result. It'll be a different set of packages. So you have to decide: is it worth being sort of up to the minute with your packages and giving up that reproducibility, that that ability to create a predictable artifact? Some of it can be mitigated by just commands. Like you can see in that command, it was running a command that says setup10.x. And so what that means is setup node 10. So that means it'll never go from like automatically upgrading from node 10 to node 12. Right. Um, and so that allows you to automatically get updates if there was a, a CVE in node 10, but not have to worry about, oh, it automatically upgraded to node 12 and something broke or changed. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a trade-off and it's sort of up to you to figure out like what's best for your situation. Um, okay, so we we have our we have our image built. Uh, let's look at Docker Images again. Uh, this time we can see. Okay, that's easy, right? So now we want to run the image. Mm -hmm. So um, Docker run. Hello, uh, sorry, Docker hello world. Latest. Good enough. Okay, I mean that's the output of my from my application, yep. so that's good. Uh, let's check out the test. Uh, curl localhost port three thousand. Okay, mm, womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is one of the things that Docker does is it creates a different environment uh, or or a isolated sandbox environment for your application. So. From the application's perspective, it's listening on port 3000. But from that command that you're running, the curl command on the host, uh, it's not. there's actually nothing listed on 3000 because there has to be a mapping from a particular port on your host machine to that port 3000 inside the container. Exactly. And also answer me this. Mm -hmm. Why, when I press control, this, by the way, is another thing that I hear <laughs> so often. Control C, like, come on, man. <laughs> what happened? Um, so there's another there's another <laughs> command line flag that you would have to install uh, add for to make it interactive and, and take your output uh, or your input from your host and put it into the container. Like exactly. right now, by default, all it's doing is taking the output of the container and it's printing it, but it's not taking any of your input and passing it into the container. Yeah. So what do I? How do I handle so this? What I generally do is I go over to the other tab. Yep. And I do a Docker ps to list out the containers. And I see a container that's running. Right. And I grab its name down there, ecstatic Lizcog. Oh, you go by the name, I go by the I go by the ID. You can you can do it. I like yeah. to have a, a, a batch history that's full of those weird R generated <laughs> names. Fair <laughs> point, fair point. And then I do a Docker kill, and that's gonna you know, that's gonna kill that container. Boom. All right, so we're back. Uh, my terminal is is free again. Uh, <laughs> so let's let's just test uh, Nathan's theory real quick. I know it's not a theory, but you know, let's, <laughs> let's let's add something to it also. So Docker run, uh, then we're going to do dash i for interactive. I also like to do dash dash init. And what this does, 
Um, early in building containers, uh, you know, people would start uh, start up a process, right? Like we're starting up Node, but they might not have coded anything into their process to understand like how to respond to certain signals. Um, you get that when you're just running in Linux because the thing that starts your process is init. And init knows what to do when a certain, when the term signal is sent or when the kill signal is sent. So what this, what, what has been added kind of recently uh, is this init option. And the init option basically means start an init process inside the container that then starts your uh, command. And that way it's there to interpret signals. And what that'll do for me then is when I press control C, it knows how to handle that signal and it'll, it'll go ahead and die for me. Um, so that's my Docker run command. Uh, the other thing that uh, Nathan pointed out was we need to connect up these ports, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm listening on port 3000. So I want to connect dash P 3000 to port 3000 inside my container. So port outside my host, port inside my container, enter, I'm listening, curl, hello world. Yeah. Awesome, right? One other thing that, uh, that I'd love to show is what happens if you take off the 3000 on that um, and let Docker actually choose a random port and then you can hit that random port uh, from the host. So once again, from the container's perspective, it's listening on port 3000, but if I do Docker PS over here, yeah, Docker PS, I see that there's a mapping from port 32768 to yeah. port 3000. And here's a secret. It starts at, I think, 32769, and it just starts decrementing by one. I've noticed that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think someone was lazy there. They didn't, they didn't random. Um, all right, so curl localhost. Well, first... Uh, curl localhost 3000, gonna fail. Yeah. Uh, 32768. There's yeah. my hello world. Now, why you'd want to do this, remember when we were talking about scaling? Um, you know, like if I wanted to run two of these on this one host, port 3000 would get used by the first one, the second one would try to use it, and that would fail. So by doing it this way, uh, you get you get the ability to sort of dynamically choose a free empty port or a free port uh, that uh, the container is going to come up on. So you'll never have any kind of port collision. Uh, the, the thing that you'll have to have though is the ability to have some logic that understands like, okay, how do I send my traffic to these ports? Mm -hmm. um, so that's usually, you know, reserved for like orchestration. Yeah. So all the orchestrators it, can do that. It's super useful. It solves this problem for you because if you have multiple applications, it used to be back in the old days, you had to create like virtual hosts and be like, I'm going to give this application port 8080 and this one 8081, 8082. You had to keep yeah. track of all of these yeah. ports and make sure there was no collision or overlap, yep. but now Docker can actually keep track of all of them and assign a port that's not currently in use. And you can see what that the, what that uh, mapping, that bridge mapping is by looking at Docker PS. Yeah, totally. All right, so uh, let's go back to our Docker file and take a look at something, because um, I, I kind of messed something up. <laughs> um, all right, so this copy thing right here. This worked, um, and it's fine, but it's not really the best way to do what we're what we're actually doing. What what I've done with this command is I've copied over my app code, but I've also copied over those built modules, uh, the my dependencies. Um, while it luckily it did work this time, it doesn't always work. Sometimes modules need to be compiled. They need to be compiled for whatever uh, you know environment they're actually going to run on and and stuff like that. So. You know, they're, they're, this could cause problems. Yeah, if you've ever tried to use a container and you see a weird error message that says something about, like, I386 architecture, yeah. <laughs> then the chances are what that means is that one of your modules inst uh, compiled, and you compiled it on your development machine, which in this case was a Mac, so it compiled for the Macintosh architecture, uh, Unix architecture. But then when you copy it into the Linux container, 
is not compatible with CentOS in yeah. there. And so it's not going to load up and your application is going to crash. Yeah. So like that doesn't mean that I can't use copy dot dot. Um, it, what it does mean though is I need to exclude some stuff from the, the Docker uh, context when I start to build a container. And just like with git ignore, you can exclude things from getting committed to git. Uh, you can do it. You can do a Docker ignore, and you can exclude uh, stuff from being sent to the Docker daemon. So remember when I pointed out the build context? Uh, I've just created a Docker ignore in my directory, and you see that I'm ignoring if I had a Git uh, directory because you know most of the time you want your stuff to be under source control. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also going to ignore the get ignore file, but then I'm going to ignore node modules. So a directory called node modules will just get excluded. If I docker build now, you see that the context is now 19.46 kilobytes. <laughs> much smaller. Much, yeah. It was <laughs> almost two megs before. Yeah. And I copied uh, my, my stuff over. Now if I docker run... Yep. We're back to, remember when we saw this error before? Mm -hmm. We're missing the module, right? We're missing the express module. So what did we have to do to solve the problem before? We had to build it. Well, this time we just need to build it inside the Docker container. All right, so what did we have to do when we were building inside the Docker container? We had to run that npm install command. Exactly. So we'll copy over our stuff, then we'll do run npm install, and while we're here, let's just talk about expose 3000. Yeah, so I love that command because it sets the default port that this container has the expectation that's going to be exposing to the world. And it just adds that little bit of extra metadata to make it easy for you to launch that container and know which port it's going to be listening on. Yeah, so basically earlier when we did this, dash... P3000 and we let the other half of it be dynamic. If you want that functionality even simpler, you can have expose 3000 in your Docker file and then just do dash capital P. Mm -hmm. And what we'll end up with here, oh yeah, I didn't build <laughs> Docker build. Yep. Then Docker run. And you see that Docker PS, we have our dynamic, you know, port assignment. So curl local host uh, port 32770, and we get hello world. So we fixed our express problem, our, our dependency problem, and we've shown you that you can have dynamic port assignment, uh, and you can build that into the Docker file itself. Mm -hmm. um, so the other cool thing that it does, and this is actually probably why most people do expose inside the Docker file, is that it's, it documents that yeah. that's the port that's important. So, um, you know, instead of having to like dig into the code or actually launch it and see what it binds to, it's just right there now. So anyone can come along and, and know that that's the port that they need to be paying attention to. Okay, so we have this container, it works. Uh, Let's take a look at the Docker file real quick. Is this is this production ready? Uh, so I would say no. Uh, there's one more step we can take to uh, optimize this build to make it a little bit faster. Um, because right now, uh, and, and we can actually uh, demonstrate that, I think. If we, if we go into that app.js file mm -hmm. and just add a comment or something like that and then rebuild. So instead of hello world, let's just, you know. Yeah. Yo. Yo world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now when you rebuild the image, uh, watch what happens. It actually has to rerun this npm install uh, step again yeah. from scratch. Yeah. And, and for it, us, that's that's a second and a yeah, half. Yeah, only, only a second and a half. This but, is not realistic, yeah. right? Uh, you, you know how in Node uh, programs, a lot of times you end up with... You know, it's not a common end up with like 500 packages. <laughs> like, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this can be many minutes. Uh, and if you had to do that every time you change your code, oh my gosh, you know, your developers would probably quit. Um, so we don't want to do it this way. There's a, there's a way to optimize it. So basically what we can do is break 
uh, oh. break this Docker file up into a couple stages and first copy in just the package.json file. Yeah. I. You know what? We've talked about this already and we've figured it out for you. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy paste. Oh, that's a that's not that's not that's a no, different one. Actually. This is a different. Oh man, am I getting ahead? Whoops. <laughs> uh oh. All right. Well, we'll we do can it, we'll we do can it manually. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna copy. Actually, let's do it. We gotta do it um, just above the current copy command. I think. Yeah. Okay. And so then after we copy and package JSON, then we run npm install. And then uh, we can copy in app.js as the last step right before we expose a 3000. All right. Now, technically, oops. Actually, you, can, uh, you, can, you should show the add command. I like that one more. Add. Oh, you like add? Yeah. All right. Especially for a single file. Um, one of the reasons why I like it is it, is it doesn't. There's no way they can ever copy a directory. More, yeah, yeah, more more things. You know? Yeah, so it's a little, a little bit. It's more explicit, I think. Yeah, I agree. And same same logic here. This particular copy is just copying everything. It'll it'll not care about the package.json anymore because that's already been copied. Mm -hmm. So it's in a it's in a layer two layers up or down, depending on how you like to think about these things. But uh, it's it's taken care of, but anything else, uh, you know, any changes would cause this to recopy. But since we know we only have one file, mm -hmm. app.js, we can just do this and we can actually add, whoops, add. All right, so build. Oh, we need a... We I need forgot. another command. <laughs> yes. We need that dot. Dot. Yeah, it tells where where to put it basically. Yeah. Source and destination. Yeah. Build. So there's our npm yep. install as we expected. But now let's go and change our code. Uh, so you know I'm not that creative. We'll go back <laughs> change to change back to hello world. <laughs> and we'll build again. And this time it went much faster. You see that for the step npm install, we still got to use cache, right? So we didn't have to rerun that step again. We did add a new app.js. So you see that one does not use cache, but it's fast, right? It's just adding one file. Yeah. And then, you know, the rest of it is kind of meta. So there's a good question here. I heard there was a benefit of combining commands instead of run curl, run yum install. Uh, you might consider run curl and yum install. So that's a great segue because that was the optimization we skipped skipped because I jumped ahead to the uh, the layers. Totally. So we need to go we need to backtrack, go back to that optimization. Thanks for reminding us on that one. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's look at okay, 379 megs is our image size now. So good marker. Uh, let's let's optimize uh, I just keep typing the same thing over. It's <laughs> it's a uh, terrible. All right, so curl basically look for run commands and especially run commands that are consecutive, and then the possibility that you could have run commands that are uh, that you could combine together. So I have three in total. You, Two are next to each other, you, so that's you, an obvious... You might have noticed when we did the Docker build, each of those separate road commands had its own layer. Exactly. Um, but if we if we do chain together the commands that are part of the run, um, as you mentioned, it'll actually only generate one layer. Exactly. And why that's important is layers are immutable. So if we like write stuff into a layer, and then later we delete something you know, that we had written... We don't, we don't get the space back. It's still in that earlier layer. But if we can do everything all together in one layer, write, use, delete, hey, we don't, we don't have to give up that space. So this is standard shell, you know, like basically conditional. Uh, as long as the thing on the left executes successfully, then the thing on the right is allowed to proceed forward. So uh, we're going to do uh, line continuation as the backslash. 
So we're just going to combine these commands together. So yum install node.js, that's an obvious one. Now, there's also a run command for npm install. Um, it's broken between, you know, with this add package.json. For style, we could leave it like this. It wouldn't hurt anything, but we could also consider doing this. Let's add package.json first. Because, you know, it's just a text file. It doesn't hurt anything for it to be there first. And then we can combine together these also. Oops. Now, what, one small downside of this, though, is that anytime you do add an extra package to your package.json, it will reinstall node from scratch. That's true. But, you know, it, it just depends on how much you want to collapse your layers together versus yep. if you want to keep your layers separate out and have one layer that's just for node and one layer that's just for your for your images. That's true. I think if you're if you have a like maybe a fairly mature uh, application and your your package.json isn't changing very much. Exactly. This could actually be really helpful. In this case for this app, we're not going to be adding any more packages to package.json very frequently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, now here while we're in here doing this, let's also mention that you know, this is an RPM based uh, distribution, but Unlike a VM, we're never going to come and install another RPM on this thing, right? We're going to build it, build a new Docker container. Um, so we want to clean up stuff that might be taking up space. So when we run a yum command, it downloads a ton of metadata. Um, so let's get rid of all that metadata. Uh, so we can do that with, if you know your yum commands, uh, yum clean all. Or we can be even more aggressive and we can just do rm-rvf, I like to see it, you know, verbose mode, mm -hmm. uh, var lib rpm, because we don't need an rpm database, and also var cache to get rid of the yum cache and anything else that, you know, old print jobs and nothing's going to be out there. But I just want to mention one thing real quick. Mm -hmm. The reason why this needs to be part of that, that same uh, run command is by default, uh, the way Docker works is the layers are all additive. So uh, just like in, with a git commit log, if you add a file in one git commit and then you delete the file in the next git commit, that file is technically still in your git history and it's still inflating the size of your git repo. Yep. So if we were to have that rm-rf command in a different layer, what would happen is all those temporary files that were added as part of the npm install and the node install uh, would actually still be in the image, still inflating its size. Right. So in this case, by putting it as part of that same chained run command, it actually cleans up all that state and reduces the size of the image uh, and never commits that into the, uh, the Docker image. Totally. I, I want to throw in, uh, you know, running as a, a non-privileged user. Um, we're going to try and do this really fast. We're getting kind of low on time and we need to, you know, get our app pushed. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> we're going to try and throw this in real quick so that you can see examples of it working. Um, and You uh, need that work directory to be at the very top, otherwise package.json would be in the wrong I was about to say, now, <laughs> now we need to like re-swizzle like, this order again. So... Uh, and that means we can't do npm install in this layer. Yep. Um, so we'll go back to see. It's all about trade trade offs, right? <laughs> um, we'll have a run for that. Um, does that look right? Run I would move install. that that trailing slash and 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 on that. Oh, right. good call. You're right because I'm not continuing anything anymore. Yeah. Um, all right, so this, okay, so what we've done, we're going to curl, we're going to yum install, we're going to create a user that we're, that our code is going to run as, and then we're going to delete a whole bunch of stuff to free up some space. Then we're going to switch to the user that we created who has a home directory, the dash, uh, I believe R makes it a system account and M creates a home directory. Um, and then we're going to add all of our code into that home directory and we're going to install as that user, and we're going to execute as that user. So, 
proper build. Looking good so far. Yep. Uh, so while this is building an answer, I noticed your basis uh, question. I noticed your basis CentOS. I've seen some applications use their language as the base image, i.e., from Python three seven. What is the advantage of using something such as that versus uh, an OS distribution? So, good question. Uh, if you go and you look at the Python image, you'll actually see that it's based on Debian, mm -hmm. um, and there are you can also do like Python Alpine and get an Alpine based uh, image. It's basically the official. Uh, distribution that Python, the community, is putting out there to be able to support. But but the, the thing is, if, for example, in Brent's case, he's more familiar in, with CentOS, and he likes CentOS better, um, he may not like working off a Debian image. Yeah. And in some cases, yeah. you may not actually <laughs> uh, trust the base operating system. So, for example, um, I kind of question sometimes the security of Alpine uh, base operating systems. Um, and I would prefer to use an operating system that's based on something that may be you know, a little bit more complete. Mm -hmm. So explicitly specifying your OS distribution gives you that most control over that mm -hmm. compared to just letting the maintainer of the language actually choose your OS. Totally. So it's just a trade-off which one you prefer. Yeah. All right. So here we are. Uh, check out our, file si or our artifact size now. 261 megs. So we are able to like sh really shrink down our image, and when we run it, let's make sure it works. <laughs> oh, I did dynamic. Oh, yeah. I need to go back to Doc. We need to <laughs> Doctor PS and see what it is. Oh yeah, you know. I'm just gonna go back to this because yeah. you know that's easier. <laughs> yeah. Bingo. All still right, works. so it still works. And let's see, I think there's, all right, so should we just push to ECR now and skip? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we should show the push now. Okay. Um, because it, basically at this point, what we have is the equivalent of a uh, code is written, we've done the git commit, but we need to do the git push to actually publish that code to the registry and so that way other people can access it. Yeah. So. I've already created a registry, but by the way, if you if you need to create one, this is how easy it is. You like fill in the name, create repository, and you're done. Um, so I've already done that. So the next thing I would need to do is view push commands, and you can see you know instructions for Mac OS or Linux. Uh, but the first thing that we do is we log into our registry. Um, so we'll go ahead and kill this and then we'll log in. Now, what is this doing? Um, if we just ran this, we, we're running this inside of a subshell and it's outputting stuff and then executing this command in our current shell. And it's what it's doing is it's executing docker login dash user aws dash p super long password that I'm now gonna clear from the screen. Uh, <laughs> By the way, if you did manage to capture that password and you can type it all in, you'd be able to push to press re registry right now. Yeah. But yeah. I'm somehow I doubt anybody has the uh, time and patience for that. Yeah. And you know <laughs> and just... it only it also only lasts for a certain period of time so it'll expire uh, pretty quickly after we use it. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, don't have too much fun. Uh, <laughs> all right so we've we've done Docker build. Uh, Next thing we're going to do, we'll, we'll go ahead and do this. You see, boom, everything cached super fast. The next thing we're going to do is tag this with a special kind of tag, different format, uh, so we don't have to rebuild. But what we're doing is we're, we're effectively adding a tag so that the tag now includes, uh, you know, name and version, uh, but it starts with host name then slash name and version. So because we have that fully qualified host name there, that tells the Docker command line utilities I need to push to uh, that remote host. So here's the command that can do that, docker push. And yeah, we say it pushing up 50, yeah. 50 60, 70. The, uh, it's going to take a little while to pull 200 megabytes. So this is one of the reasons why you want your image to be as small as possible. Exactly. If I were on an airplane, this yeah. would be the rest of my flight. <laughs> so. 
Well, and the reverse also happens. When your server is going to run this code, it has to download it. So yeah. the smaller it is, the faster it's going to be able to download it and get your application up and running. Yeah. So what would that look like? We would have to Docker pull this same name. So this image URI, we would have to Docker pull. Oh, yeah. Hey, you know what? Let's just clean off yep. uh, system prune like we did before. Docker images, nothing there. Docker pull. And you'll notice what happened here is it started with nothing and we did not build the image. All we're doing is we're pulling it down from ECR. Yeah, so you could do this on an EC2 instance, just anywhere Docker is running, Docker pull, then Docker run, and you're good to go. And you don't have to have Node installed, you don't have to have Express installed, mm -hmm. Docker run. Oh, oh uh, yeah, wrong, yeah, yeah. wrong image. Let's yep. do it over here. Uh, there we go. Curl. Oh, <laughs> I forgot dash p. You forgot your, you forgot your port right. there. <laughs> dash p, 3,000, 3,000. Yep. Curl. Yep, and it works. Yes. Sweet. All right, so I hope that uh, you guys got like you know everything you were looking for. This <laughs> isn't all, obviously. Uh, we, we didn't really go into any of the the higher level things like how do I scale a containerized application or anything. But we really wanted to show in this session was how to go about constructing your first image, starting from just your application and how to push it and how to pull it down and run it. Um, but if you keep watching this particular series, you'll see more examples in the future of how to do some of the deeper things with uh, your application. Totally. So I've just made this repository that I was working from open. And in this repository, we also talk about like shrinking down uh, your, your container, maybe by using Alpine Linux instead of CentOS. Uh, so it'll give you some strategy there as well. Uh, check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, tweet at me, Brent Contained. Tweet at Nathan. Mm -hmm. Nathan Kapek? Yeah, uh, Nathan Kapek. Nathan Kapek. Uh, let us know what you think. Tune in for the next Office Hours where we will get more advanced than this. Yeah, Thanks, everyone. Sure. Thanks a lot.